구체적으로 이제 이스라엘 성지 수녀나 이스라엘 회복에 대해서 더 성경적으로 알았다니 너무 감사하고요. 이번에 그 세미나 기간을 통해 가지고 또 제가 새로운 면으로 좀 많이 알게 된것 같아요. 특히 이스라엘의 그 지나온 역사라든가 처한 상황이라든지 또 앞으로 복음화시키고 한국 하나님 앞으로 인도하려면 우리가 어떻게 해야 될까 진짜 기도 제목을 많이 안고 들어가고 이곳에 와서 다시 생생하게 모든 강사님들의 그런 강의를 들을 때마다 아, 다시 제 마음에 뜨거움이 올라오면서 진정으로 이스라엘에 대한 파스콘의 역할이 무엇인가를 다시 깨닫게 됐고요 아카데미를 통해서 하나님의 마음, 이 땅의 그 쏟는 마음을 저희들이 알았고 어, 12명의 강사님들을 통해서 풍성한 어, 하나님의 그 말씀과 마음을 저희들이 받았습니다. 아메리카 Two mass shootings in less than a day leave at least 29 dead and 53 injured. NBC News reports over less than 13 hours and nearly 1,600 miles apart, two mass shootings this weekend left at least 29 dead and 53 injured, leaving the country reeling from yet more gruesome scenes of violence and death. On Saturday morning, a gunman opened fire into a crowd at El Paso, Texas, retail area that is popular among both local residents and shoppers from just across the so southern border with Mexico. Then, early Sunday, a shooter attacked a crowd outside a popular bar in Dayton, Ohio, as patrons were enjoying a night out. One suspect was in custody in the El Paso case. Federal prosecutors were treating it as a domestic terrorism case. In Dayton, responding officers killed the gunman, police say. Let me give you a little more information. Patrick Crucius, 21, from the Dallas area, apparently left a manifesto behind outlining what motivated him to drive to El Paso, Texas, about 600 miles away, and launch his senseless carnage. Ohio gunman hailed Satan on Twitter, wrote, I'm going to hell and I'm not coming back. That comes from heavy.com. Connor Betts, was named by police as the body armor wearing mass gunman who fatally shot at least nine people, including his own sister, while wounding at least 27 more in a popular bar and restaurant district in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, now let's pause just a moment. You may be a little bit interested or you may have already read it, but the manifesto that was left by the El Paso shooter went into all kinds of detail about why he was so disillusioned. He feels like America is being swamped 
by foreign elements as they continue to pour into our country. All of us are concerned about that, of course. But yet he seemed to think his answer was to start a war on Hispanics that are coming into America and make it so tough that they would quit coming. He also debated back and forth about the Republican Party, the Democratic Party. It was a rant. Now, none of it justified what he did, period. But I want to talk to you today about what we can do. It's like we've been paralyzed for several years now. We have incident after incident after incident, and everybody says, what can we do? What can we do? And as I was thinking about coming to this microphone today, I thought, I know what to do. Why don't I talk about it? I went to the scriptures. In Genesis 6, 11 through 13, Noah said the earth was filled with violence. Now, here's what it says in verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Does it sound familiar? And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. All right. So the societal condition in Noah's day, and this was the time before the great flood that destroyed all human life off the face of the earth, except for eight righteous souls. So now then, let's talk about it. Because the scripture goes on to tell us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when Jesus comes. Luke chapter 17, verse 26 tells us this. Let me read it to you exactly. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So, violence filled the earth back then. Violence is fill, filling the earth right now. Now, John the Baptist came preaching as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And in Luke 3, 3, verse number 14, soldiers came to him demanding of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So where is all this violence coming from? Do we know? I think really we do. We're going to talk about it as soon as we get right back. When you, as soon as you say end time, they say, whoa, the end of the world. When's it going to be? And you can see this mask of fear. I'm not telling you the end time is coming. I'm telling you, you live in it right now. Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 4. The first beast was like a lion. We have the evil used continually to depict the United States of America. You see it on governmental dot. We are at the, the generation for which these people. not miss one segment of understanding end time because I've had many people tell me it's changed their life forever. Many of the major prophecies of the Bible are given to us two, three, some of them as high as four or five times. There 
there's not any chance it's not going to happen because it's in your Bible, it's prophesied, and the prophecies always come back. I want to talk to you today from my heart to yours. This is a huge problem that we're facing. And everyone just shrugs and says, what can we do about it? Do we ban all guns? Do we throw the Second Amendment away? Is that the answer? And if we do that, does that mean only criminals would have guns? But we know we've got a problem. So... Do we just do nothing or what can we do? I want to talk to parents, first of all, right now. The first thing that you and I can do is to bring daily prayer back into our homes, especially if we have children. They should know what it is for mother and dad to gather around in the living room or in the den and say, we're going to pray. I'll never forget when I was just a, a kid, I probably would have been maybe six, seven years of age. My sister had a friend who always came by because they wanted to walk to school together. So this particular time, our family was running just a little bit late and this girl came by, if I remember right, her name was Leslie. And so she came and knocked on the door. Is Miriam ready? Miriam was my older sister. And mother said, well, yeah, but uh, we need uh, just a few minutes to have prayer before she leaves. And so Leslie waited while mother had prayer with me and my sister, Miriam, and when Miriam went out on the sidewalk, she told us later on when she came, came home later that day that Leslie looked at her and said, I wish my mother would pray with me before I leave for school. And I've never forgotten that because let's face it, the vast majority of people today just don't have time to pray or they don't take time or they're too ashamed or they just don't believe in it anymore. Now, I remember when we had none of these mass killings back when I was in school, you just didn't hear of it. We didn't even know anything about homosexuality because back in 1960, it was against the law. Homosexual acts were against the law in every state in America because the Bible's against it. And back then, most people still believed the Bible was the truth. However, the atheists wormed their way in and began to file lawsuits through liberal courts, and they were able to get the Bible banished from our schools. And then they got prayer banished from our schools. Then things started to go wrong. And then violence picked up. Then television with all of its violence escalated. Then there were the video games. They were full of violence. Church attendance dropped off. Bible knowledge severely decreased. So I want to ask you today, do you take your families to church regularly? I mean, every week. I remember when I was growing up, of course, my family was very religious. My parents were both ministers. I went to four services a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday and Friday. So we did all of that together. But what does all that mean? Uh, where do we go? Because could we return? I mean, I want to talk to you about it because it is so absolutely important. Um, let me talk to you about what we can do. We don't have to just throw up our hands 
and say, I can't do anything. We don't have to do that. There are things that we can do. Let me explain to you. Um, Do you monitor what your kids watch? Do you know what's on their iPads and their computers? Are you following that? And does it matter? Now, I want to talk to the preachers today. When you go to that pulpit, are you making a difference or are you just trying to make sure you don't say anything that will ruffle any feathers? I mean, are there preachers today that are standing there looking down at those families and saying, brothers and sisters, make sure you keep violence out of your home. Now, remember the scripture in Noah's day, violence filled the land. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man. We're almost there. All of you that listen to this program regularly, we give you sign after sign, proof after proof, fulfilled prophecy after fulfilled prophecy. You know, we are almost there. And that's what's so critical. That's what I want you to understand. Okay, so I'm asking you preachers, are you praying? Are you getting your messages from God? Is it something that's handed down to you from your religious headquarters? Do you, are you given an outline? Are you, is it sent in the email? Or do you pray until your heart burns with a message straight from heaven? You've been alone with God and you stand up and you begin to preach. You preach to men, be faithful to your wives and to women, be faithful to your husbands. You say, oh, I I couldn't do that. I would run off some of my biggest supporters. You know, that's one of the problems we've got today. We've got too many preachers preaching for money and trying to build the biggest congregation. So they specialize in not stepping on any toes. Now, we don't want to step on toes. But somehow, if the preachers don't hold up a standard of righteousness and teach people, No violence. Don't hate people. Don't talk bad about your neighbors, about your boss. What are you doing? I mean, really, this is not that difficult. We need to get back to biblical principles. The soldiers came to John and said, what do we do? John was preaching, repent. They said, what do we do in order to live right? He said, Do violence to no man. Don't falsely accuse anyone. And even be content with your wages. Don't be a striker. Don't be a labor rebel rouser. You say, well, that's foreign language to where we are today. Well, is the Bible right or are we right? Now, many of the problems we have today, you can trace right back to broken homes. I noticed that one of these shooters was not being raised by his parents. He was living with his grandparents. Apparently his parents had broken apart. And that's not the case every time, but it's the case much of the time. The drugs, the immorality, most of it happens when there's not a solid home. A man and a woman together raising their children They tell me that 50% of all young men in America today are being raised without a father. Well, God ordained the family. So do we just shrug it off and say, well, that's the society we live, live in? Or is it time for the preachers to stand in the pulpit and say, husbands, be faithful to your wives? Because the Bible teaches that all adulterers will have their part in the lake of fire. Oh, should I even mention the lake of fire? Uh, It's in the Bible, but it's not a very popular message today. So are we all going to give an account? Did anyone tell these two young men that if they killed somebody, they would spend eternity in hell? Now, apparently they told Connor Betts because he said, I'm going to hell and I'm not coming back. But he wasn't taught right because I was taught you don't go to hell no matter what because it is a place of unquenchable fire that you will never escape from. 
And the fear of God was drilled into me by my parents. And am I thankful? You better believe I am. It never crossed my mind one time to kill anyone. That's something that you just don't consider. Now, if my parents had allowed me to have video games where everybody's shooting everybody and everybody's dying and to watch movies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please don't turn me off. I mean, while everybody's saying, well, let's pass this law, pass this law, I don't think we can pass enough laws to stop this. I think this is a heart deal. And the first thing that has to happen before we can teach our children morals, we have to have the morals ourselves. If we've gotten away from God and we lie when it's convenient in our businesses, then we certainly cannot teach our children to not lie, to always be truthful. I mean, I was, I was told that Abraham Lincoln, someone gave him two cents too much change when he bought something and he walked five miles to return the money. So do we have that kind of a conscience today or have we become an immoral society? Now I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you husbands. And we got way too many husbands that leave the moral leadership of the family to the wife. But I want to tell all of you out there, God made you the head of your home, husband. Now, I don't care what different movements are trying to say about that. Check your Bible out. Our problem today is we think we're smarter than God and we have left the guidebook that God gave to us. The Bible is the operation manual for your life and for mine. It tells you how to raise your children. It tells you how to conduct your family. It tells you, tells you how to be successfully married. I pastored for 33 years. And I had a lot of people come to me that were having marital problems, seeking help. And I took them right to the principles of the Bible. If I could get two people, a husband and wife, to both agree to abide by God's word, we could solve any marital problem they had. You know, usually they came into my office wanting to talk about who's right. The husband sits here, the wife sits here, and they all start in. She did this, she did this, and then, she, oh, but he did this, he did this, and back and forth they went for a little while. I would sit there and listen for a few minutes, and I'd say, okay, time out. I don't really care who's right here. I want to talk about what is right. If we can figure out what's right and both of you do agree, agree to do what's right, then we can solve your marital problem. And as soon as I got them talking about what is right, instead of who was right, we were 75% home in solving that marital problem. But when you get a selfish man or a selfish woman saying, I'm going to have my affair no matter what. I don't care if it hurts my eight-year-old girl or my 12-year-old boy. I don't care what it does. I'm going to have my way. Well, when you go there, sir, ma'am, you're getting ready to wreak havoc to their lives and to yours because don't be deceived. Whatever a person sows, that's what they're going to reap. If we want to fix all this in America, bring the Bible back into the school. You say, oh, we can't do that. We've got freedom of religion. Well, we've always had freedom of religion. We had freedom of religion when this nation was founded. And you know one of the first things that Congress did? They allocated money for 20,000 Bibles to put them in all the public schools. They said, you can't even call it education if the students are not educated in the principles of the Bible because the Bible is the source of all truth. You say, but what about this religion and that religion? That's our problem. We're trying to be all things to all people. You say, but how do we know the truth? Well, there is a truth. Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth. And not everything is true. I mean, you can talk about other religions. Well, I think this religion is true. That doesn't make it true. There is one God, He's the God of the Bible. We know the truth by studying his word. And when we veer off that path, we get El Paso. 
we get Dayton, Ohio. And that's what's happened to our nation because a people that doesn't stand for something will fall for anything. That's what's going on. I wonder how much difference it would make if every person in your community and mine would start off tomorrow morning by gathering the children in the living room and saying, we're going to pray before you go. We're going to read a scripture from God's word before you go. That would be really uncomfortable for some people because it's been way too long since they did it. Now, most of us back two or three generations, we've got a praying grandmother. I have people tell me about it all the time. Oh, my grandmother, she used to do this, this, and this. And sometimes I'm tempted to say, cheerio, what's that do for you? Because it only takes one generation to lose the touch of God off of this nation. We need a spiritual revival in America and nothing else is going to work. It's, there's going to be another El Paso. There's going to be another Dayton, Ohio and on and on and on. We've had so many of these attacks over the last year. It is sickening all because the Bible says my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me the fountain of living waters and they've hewn them out cisterns that can hold no water. We can look anywhere we want to, but there's one thing that's true. Jesus Christ is the answer to the problems of the world. There is no other answer. When Almighty God robed himself in flesh at Bethlehem, he came to this earth. He said, I have come to bear witness of the truth. Now, Pilate, he cynically said to Jesus, Huh, what is truth? I mean, he was educated. He was a politician, but he didn't have a clue what the truth was. And people will say, nobody even knows the truth. Wrong, absolutely wrong. If you know your Bible and you know God and you walk close to him, you know the truth. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free, free from addictions of gambling, of alcohol, of drugs, the drug problem in America. If all people would get saved, the drug problem would go because Jesus Christ sets people free from their addictions. All right, now I'm running out of time in this segment. I want to back up and ask you one more time. Are we willing to make a radical change and don't wait on your next door neighbor. Each of us have to do it in our house. Will you make sure your family is in church this week and next week and next week? Let me tell you, that has influenced my life. I'm 74 years of age today. Thank God for wonderful parents. I hope your children someday will say, Thank God for wonderful parents. Do you have family prayer? Do you pray together? There's a slogan that says, the family that prays together stays together. Do you know how to pray? Could we have a revival in America that would return us to our grass roots? I mean, rather than go to church because you have to, could there be a sweeping revival that would cause a groundswell of devotion to God and people would really learn God again and people would really know God again? This may be one of the most important subjects we ever talk about. I know we're not on prophecy right now exactly, except for the scripture that says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What took them down the road they went? It was because the Bible says every thought of their heart was evil continually. I mean, we live in a day anymore where nothing is sin. I mean, you can do anything you want to do, 
a man can date a man, a woman can date a woman, and it's diametrically opposed to God's word. I mean, major so-called Christian denominations are putting same-sex couples in as their pastors these days. Is it any wonder we're having mass shootings? Because the Bible doesn't mean anything. If the Bible teaches that if a man lies with mankind and it's an abomination and we don't pay attention to that, why should we be ad- pay attention to thou shalt not kill? The same Bible, the same God, the same commandment. So here we are, America and the world has forsaken its standard of values. All of our laws, if you go to the Supreme Court today, you'll see Moses standing with the Ten Commandments. But of course, all that's decoration. That was from a bygone era. We don't pay any attention to those things anymore. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court has said you can't have it out there on the lawn of the courthouse anymore. You cannot have it displayed in the classroom and on and on and on. So we are forsaking our anchor and then we wonder why we're drifting. We wonder why the chaos. That's what we need to be talking about today.